welcome to All About Campion, an introduction to loving the films of Jane Campion. I'm Inga Kang, a critic at the Washington Post, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Daniel Schrader, a podcast producer at Slate. Hey, Ingu. Last time, we went deep into what Daniel rather chaotically concluded was Jane Campion's best film, Holy Smoke. Today, we are going to be jumping ahead four years to 2003's In the Cut, an erotic thriller and serial killer mystery that was, I think I'm saying pretty accurately, eviscerated upon release. But I think uh, a film that has been somewhat recuperated in recent years. And we are so happy to have for this discussion, screenwriter April Wolf. Hi, April. Hi. it's Um, me yay welcome so so what i remember about the initial release of in the cut and maybe these are your recollections to april is that the press release was really dominated by meg ryan's failed pivot from romantic comedies into quote-unquote more serious fare in the cut came out five years after you've got mail probably the last of ryan's rom-com reign of the 80s and 90s Mm -hmm. Uh, critics and journalists breathlessly noted ryan's brown hair and her nudity which was assumed at the time to be some attempt at reviving career which doesn't even make sense to me yeah in addition to ryan the film co-stars jennifer jason lee as her what i think we called back then like nymphomaniac half-sister Mark Ruffalo as a cop investigating a serial killer mutilating women's bodies. And Kevin Bacon as a guy that Meg Ryan's character, Franny, has slept with twice and who will not leave her alone. And who's apparently uncredited according to uh, IMDb. Hilarious. (laughs) Uh, The film is adapted from Susanna Moore's novel, though as we will discuss, Campion changed enough details that Moore later said that the film is more the director's story than hers. Nicole Kidman, who starred in Campion's Portrait of a Lady, initially optioned the book to star in the film adaptation, but she had to drop out because she was going through a little divorce with a rather famous person. Who? <laughs> and is listed as producer only. Uh, Ryan recalls Campion saying of the film, we are going to kill romance and give birth to love, which I feel like is a very Campion thing to say. In the Cut was Campion's first film to be shot entirely in the U.S., mostly in New York's Lower East Side and Tribeca neighborhoods. And actually, a lot of it reminded me of Sex and the City, uh, which is also about quote-unquote liberated women in their 30s searching for love and finding mostly only dick. Um, and I think neither of you have actually seen Sex and the City, but I will force you guys to talk about it. Or I will force you guys to listen to me talk about it anyway. I've seen both movies, and that's it. Tragic. <laughs> so, Daniel, please give us a quick summary of In the Cut. All right. Uh, well, it'll be quick in that I'll read it fast, but uh, here we go. <laughs> In the Cut opens on sisters Franny, played by Meg Ryan, and Pauline, played by Jennifer Jason Lee, waking up together in Franny's apartment. They part ways as Franny heads to a bar to meet up with a student in her English class so she can mine his knowledge of street slang, because she is apparently writing Urban Dictionary. <laughs> While in the bar, she goes to the bathroom and witnesses a shadowy figure with a spade tattoo on his wrist get a blowjob from a woman with blue nails. The next day, she is in English class teaching about the book to the lighthouse, a definitely not significant image viewers should not be paying attention to. When she gets home, she meets Detective Malloy, played by Mark Ruffalo, who is looking into the death of a woman last seen at the same bar where Franny met her student. She also meets his partner, De- Detective Rodriguez, played by Nick Demichi. After a few days of increasingly intimate interactions with Malloy, Franny is mugged on her way home one night and seeks out Malloy for comfort. They have sex, and we see Mark Ruffalo's dick. The Thank next. you for that detail. Always. Uh, the next day at a coffee shop, Franny is telling her sister Pauline about the night with the detective when they are interrupted by John Graham, played by Kevin Bacon, a creepy medical student who's obsessed with Franny and won't leave her alone. Later, another murder happens, this time at a laundromat. Police suspect it's the same killer. Franny and Malloy drive out to the woods and have a weird intimate date together where he teaches her to use a gun. Again, not foreshadowing. 
Later, Franny goes to Pauline's apartment to discover she has been murdered now, too, and Franny begins to suspect Malloy is the murderer. He shows up at her apartment, and they have sex. Malloy says the title of the film, and then (laughs) she cuffs him to the radiator and runs to the safety of his partner, Detective Rodriguez, who drives her out to a lighthouse, remember that, and attempts to murder her because, spoiler alert, he is the killer. She shoots him and returns home, curling up next to a still-cuffed Malloy on a floor presumably soaked in piss. (laughs) And that is in the cup. I feel like that's like a pretty salty summary for you. I was having fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> I rewatched it this morning. I needed to entertain myself somehow. <laughs> so April, uh, we asked you to be on the podcast and then to pick whichever film that you wanted. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, C- Sweetie was taken. And so yeah. you picked this one. Why? Well, I mean, obviously, Sweetie Sweetie is my favorite because I love movies that push you to an inevitable, awful end (laughs) that you can't stop. But In the Cut is a second favorite. I actually wrote about this movie in the Rotten Tomatoes book, Rotten Movies. We love to defend it. Um, Oh, wow. So i had been thinking about it for the past few years um, because of that. But, uh, you know, it kind of sadly has a 30 something rating on Rotten Tomatoes but I I picked it because first off I love thrillers I love you know psychosexual thrillers um especially of that era and this one is so different from the rest of those despite yes. the fact that it's like the source material and and those things are um you know uh have the kind of plot that you would expect of these things. But I, in my head, I keep imagining like, you know, how would this be if Verhoeven got a hold of the source material? You know, mm. like the, in the way that like Campion didn't kind of dilute any of her style for this. Um, it is so, so specifically her in a way that no one else could have done. Um, and and I think the the more that I think about it and the more that I watch it, the more I appreciate it because the text is actually quite dense and there's so much going on in terms of um, the the kind of artistry of uh, production design and, and cinematography and um, uh, even um, wardrobe uh, that sometimes I can get a little bit distracted by some of these things. And so I miss some of the details and some of the dialogue. And then when I tune in again, um, if I watch it, you know, uh, subsequent times, I, I always come away with something new, like a, a different idea. Because like, honestly, the first time that I watched it, um, my takeaway when I thought about it like a year later was like, I really couldn't remember some of the things that happened. Yeah. Um, and but I w- remembered was the kind of sense that I had of it. So I, I, I never lose that kind of feeling or emotion and so much of that has to do with um the color palette that she's using and the cinematography with the color palette uh and also these these textures because there's so many kind of intimate close-ups in a handheld um and there's a lot of um production design there's a lot of um pieces of uh either props or scenery that are in the foreground and blurred so there's almost like a, a kind of it's it's an effect of old timey movies of having Vaseline on the outside of the lens, but instead it's having these, these um, pieces of the production design out of focus and kind of obscuring parts of the frame. And these are things that like I can remember, but sometimes I can't even remember the plot, which is weird because this is such a plot heavy movie, but I, but that's what sets it apart for me from all of these other thrillers. It's also like a really, simple plot too like in the sense like you can sort of summarize the plot in like one sentence yeah. um but i it's really funny that you say that because i think i saw this movie like a few years after release and i couldn't remember anything about it either like i had like two very vivid memories of like two particular scenes in the movie and then the rest of it was like very gone from like my consciousness Mm -hmm. Um, You said that you found this movie, like, very Campion-esque, and I think that, like, on the one hand, that's true, and then on the other hand, there's a sort of, like, wooziness to the look Mm -hmm. of the film that, like, is actually quite different for her, and so I wanted to get your sense of, like, what you found to be so Campion-esque about In the Cut. Well, I think it's... The difference is there's there's a certain kind of clarity in some of the images that she has in her other work, you know, and 
which I know runs counter to what I'm talking about when there's just like, um, you know, obscuring certain parts of the frame and, and that kind of look. But if you look at her films that uh, have kind of dream states in them, it, it is exactly this look. If you mm-hmm. look at Top of the Lake and the dreamscape scenes in that, um, the the style similarities are all there. It's just that what she did is she made this entire film a kind of dream state. So it's like she has all of that. It's already in her kind of arsenal of how she directs film. It's just that she did an entire movie like that, um, which I found pretty fascinating because at first I wasn't sure if it kind of fit into the, the, you know, the oeuvre or whatever that she has, but it's all there. And in fact, I think that you can see it, you can see a refined version of it in her later films. So I'm really excited. I haven't seen the power of the dog, but I'm really excited to see if she employs any of those techniques. Um, Cause I know that she has the clarity and the crisp vision, but I've seen stills of, um, uh, Kristen Dunst and um, and I, I feel like I'm getting like a, some of those vibes because there's there's like dim lighting and some of those things and I'm, I'm very excited to see, see if she uses any of those again. Hmm. I feel like one moment that I felt like I really saw Jane Campion's campionness was uh, a moment that I was reminded of from the piano which is um, when when Meg Ryan's character Franny is like recounting her uh recounting the story of her mother and father's meeting and uh the kind of like fairy tale quality of it and it's very similar to the story that uh the daughter tells in the piano and there's mm-hmm. this like there's a dream sense to that like uh sepia tone kind of ice skating look that is very like not of this world in a way that the weird one moment in the like retelling of Flora's parents meeting is like the shot of the like guy on fire that's like a cartoon drawing or whatever and so it's mm-hmm. like there's both these like moments of like childish and then adult uh fantasization about like what your parents were or who th- how they met and things like that so it was just like a refinement of even that imagery yeah, I think what's really interesting about this movie, um, especially when we're comparing it to that, is that I think with the piano and you, like the like imagined story of like how her parents came to be from the perspective of Flora, there's a sense that like we are given these uh, really like beautiful, really fantastical narratives about what romance can look like. And uh, there's sort of, like, the dramatic irony of, like, us knowing that, like, it's probably all really fake. And I think, like, that uh, disjunct between the fantasy version and, like, what we know, uh, like, is basically, like, impossible is sort of, like, what is part of, like, the process that Franny goes through here, where she, at the beginning of the movie, or towards the beginning, recounts a story to her half-sister, and then later on, we well, and even have when her... she recounts it, she says like, or at least that's how she told it. Yeah, but I think like it takes it further from there, where she has that dream like toward the end of the movie, where she imagines like her father like basically chopping her mom up into like pieces, like with his ice skates, disarticulating her, <laughs> and. I think so much about this, like, movie is sort of about, like, the disillusionment with romance. And I, yeah, like, I found, like, that part of the movie, like, really interesting. I think to sort of take a step back and, like, talk about the movie in, like, a really more basic way. I found this movie, like, so interesting. And yet I feel like if I had to say whether it's, like, a good movie or, like, a bad movie, I'm probably part of, like, that 30% rating where I'm, like, I don't think this is, like, a quote-unquote good movie, but it's also, like, an endlessly interesting one. I think that, like, there's, like, parts of it where the pacing really, like, feels laggy and there's, like, a sort of lack of forward momentum because you don't get, like, the constant thrum of, like, who is the killer and, like, that like momentum that you sort of need to like feel invested in the story 
But on the other hand, I feel like this movie is really prescient in a lot of ways, especially for entertainment to like right now. And I feel like uh, that's one of the ways that like Jane Campion feels so influential, even working largely outside of like the Hollywood system to like what kinds of stories Hollywood tells now. I think the thing that like I got the most out of this movie is that it is largely a story about these women who are presumed to be liberated and sort of like want sexual experimentation and want uh, sexual liberation and yet they are living in this city that is like constantly teeming with violence against women and basically every character every male character with a name in this movie is like someone who is potentially a killer and so you have this like juxtaposition of like women sort of like wanting a kind of sexual emancipation and then also contending with like the reality that like dating and sleeping around and just like existing in the world like as like a woman surrounded by men basically means like you have to be paranoid about like who might be the next like man who tries to kill you yeah well i think this is one of the things that i'm saying in terms of um liking this movie the more i watch it um uh is has a lot to do with what you're talking about in terms of pacing and you know these uh these ways in which it feels like maybe the narrative has dropped the the kind of mystery because i think that it never drops the mystery it's just that she obscures everything in the same way that she's obscuring things in the frame she's thematically obscuring other stuff um and because the biggest clues are are dropped into the dialogue just randomly and they're like there's they're not like a lot of attention paid to them um which is interesting because it's a misdirection because the cinematography is moving it's roving and it's and it's often trying to it's like mimicking an eye and it's trying to collect clues but the clues are often wrong and then what you need to be doing is paying attention like listening to someone and we're not and we're not listening because we're too distracted by everything else and the thing is that like if you are listening to it you know i don't know how like you know spoilers or whatever but like if you're listening you're gonna know in the first conversation with the real killer that it's him if you're actually listening and the way that his friend defends him and says he wasn't gonna kill her and it's like there's if you are listening and paying attention and like not trying to your eye trying to rove and see what else is there and trying to put pieces together like it's it's all there within that first conversation in that first meeting um so i really like listening to that and trying to like fight my urge to like try to you know visually put the pieces together when I watch it again because I'm like you know it's it's just that we're so inside this woman's head and she doesn't know what to look at so we in turn don't know what to look at or don't know what piece of information should be important but we're like collecting all of the information and then it just you know, kind of falls into place later on. I I think also... Wait, can I say one thing in response to what you were saying? Yeah. Um, I think that is actually, like, one of, like, the, like, subversions of the serial killer mystery genre that I think was, like, less recognized at the time and perhaps, like, now is easier to see. Like, most, a lot of sort of, like, murder procedurals are from the mm-hmm. point of view of, like, the cop and basically here like cops are the enemy <laughs> yeah uh it's, in some ways it's like a very like a cab like a movie i mean like the cops here like are like a the villain and b like protectors of the villain and mm-hmm. c like someone who is like not even the savior right like in the end franny saves herself and so yeah. even though she's sort of like drawn to mark ruffalo's like I don't know, like, masculinity, his, like, like rough masculinity. Like, ultimately, the point is that, like, the cops are useless, like, in this particular genre. And I think, like, again, that's something that's, like, a lot easier to see now, especially in, like, a period where we have a lot more skepticism toward the cops, or, or maybe I'm just, like, speaking for myself, because one of the two, like, images I really remember from the movie seeing it for the first time 20 years ago 
is that there's like a scene where Mark Ruffalo comes into like basically like asks her can I ask you some questions there's been like a murder and like pieces of a woman's body parts have been found in your backyard and she's like how do I know you're really a cop like tell me your badge number so I can like call the police department Mm -hmm. to make sure you actually are a cop and I remember being really shocked by that scene because it did not occur to me when I was like a teenager or whatever that I don't know that like someone would require that type of vetting um so anyway um, hey cab yeah James sure Dan- daniel why did why did you put this at the top of of the list like what are you interested in in the mystery or oh no i actually didn't care for this you didn't uh, at all okay <laughs> i will say uh i okay so i feel like i was watching jane campion as a lifetime movie oh like that's what this movie felt like in some ways, and maybe it's because I've been listening to a podcast about Lifetime movies. But also, it's just like it, like this entire movie was red herrings after red herrings after red herrings, where it's like everything is a misdirect, nothing is true. Uh, who am I supposed to be looking at? I'm supposed to like, but then also because everybody's so suspicious, it's like, oh well, it can't be that person because it's like too obvious that it's that person. It can't be that person because it's too obvious that it's that person, which is like a very Lifetime movie type of thing. It feels like so. Um, I mean, I. I like parts of this movie. I think it'd be great if it were an hour 30, uh, but Jane Campion loves a two hour runtime. So um, we are given, I think some really interesting longer uh, scenes that I do like, but also that it really just drags where like, there are so many points where I'm just like, do we need this scene? Can we just edit this out? But uh, that's just how I felt about it. So, um, but I'm, I'm an idiot. So I'm probably wrong. No, I mean, that's a, this is such a divisive movie, and that's I'm just a big fan of divisive movies in general because I, I, I like the things that kind of grate on people, <laughs> which is, <laughs> historically has been my thing. I'm like very interested in like... Is that why we're friends? Because I'm Maybe. It's just like, I call it like my they shoot horses, don't they, like mind, where I'm just like, yeah, make it, make it just like harrowing for me sometimes. Like I... I, I enjoy that. I, I I think too one of the things that I like about this is just the characterizations of these these two women, these sisters, because um it's just it's interesting how they're shot and it's interesting how they talk to one another and it feels really truthful in certain ways because there's these two sisters and the music too, like if, when you open up with K Sarah, Sarah, um you're doing a, a few different things. Because that that song has a cinematic history that is, you know, if if it weren't already used as like a Ad slow, nauseam. like a slow, sad version in the original that Doris Day did for The Man Who Knew Too Much. You know, it's one of, it's it's kind of like how we always like slow down pop music now for the trailers. But it was already done. Like when the first time it was used, it was like you know, saying is a joyful thing and, uh, and the man who knew too much. And then it's kind of done. It's like slow, sad, different version. Like it's got, it's got so many different shades to it of the meaning. And it's basically like futility and fatality. Like there is nothing that you can do. You can try, but you can't escape this. Like, and to me, I think that really encapsulates that song encapsulates Meg Ryan's character of, this person who kind of drifts along and the difference is that her sister like does things. She like goes after people. She like, she like, she picks up somebody else's dry cleaning. Yeah. She's like, she's (laughs) like the other end of the spectrum of just like, you know, like manic energy. Like if I want something, I go out and get it. And then when you hear them talking, there's uh, a song um, performed by Annie Lennox, uh, Bob Marley song. It's called waiting in vain. And it's another thing of just like every song on the soundtrack is like telling you um, if you're if you're listening like where she's at and what her desire levels are because she starts singing along with it where she's like I don't want to wait in vain and then she gets this charm bracelet and it's it's kind of like a goal set for her you know like an almost like an advent calendar of just like one thing after another and then it's just like am I just gonna wait in vain am I gonna do something so it's kind of like the last time I watched it, I thought it was more of like an awakening of a woman into going after what she wants in life than just a murder story. Like that's that was the thing that, that became really interesting to me is like um, that trajectory 
but I, I think the music, despite the fact that it's like not my favorite songs or anything, I think it really works for these characters and kind of telling you who they are and what their um, what their psyche is like in that moment. I think the Jennifer Jason Lee character, like her presence, like this, like super intense like super like impulsive presence is so intoxicating and I think in some ways like a much better like match for the atmospherics of the movie and sort of just like the endless movement of like the city and just like that hot stickiness that you feel that I kept wishing she was a protagonist of this movie and that's how I feel whenever I see Jennifer Jason Lee in anything. Yeah, that's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, you know, always, always uh, undervalued. Never seen enough. Yeah, but I think, like, that also sort of, like, added to, like, that syrupy molasses feeling of, like, being stuck with Meg Ryan for me a little bit. And just because, like, she was so, like, passive a lot of the time. And so it Yeah, case or Asara. She's like she's gonna have to fight the inertia, you know. I think like this is like a movie where like it feels to me a lot more like intellectually satisfying than like viscerally satisfying, at mm. least for me. Yeah, the intellectual satisfaction of uh subway poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel and I have like completely turned on all of the poetry in Jane Campion's movies, unfortunately. And it's like a thing that she will never stop doing. Um, um I think it's great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. I think poetry is also undervalued and I like it. I like the artifice of people stumbling into it in in the world. I think it makes sense for the character, but I think watching so many of her movies in such a short period of time and realizing that she like will not stop doing this. Um, as I think graded on us a little bit, but you like grading things, so I, I mean, I like it when you stick to your like you have a style and you fucking yeah. like go to the ends of the earth with it, you know? Yeah, well, I'm just glad that this movie didn't in the same way as the book, which is apparently her dying thinking of the subway poetry. Is it really? Yes, oh, um, god, <laughs> <laughs> so at least Campion fixed that. If my last thoughts as like a human being on earth is subway of poetry <laughs> like just kill me all over again fingers crossed um <laughs> it's gonna be drops of jupiter she's just gonna be like thinking uh, about train now she's back in the atmosphere yep uh, that'd be <laughs> great um while this like slow uh at times uh molasses movie was going on i just because of the vibe of new york city at that time i felt like the much more manic much more fun american psycho was going down just like right down the street like at the same time. <laughs> uh yeah i just like that was the kind of energy i got from the the grime of new york city it was just a, a much different take on the murdering in new york city vibe so yeah the, you know the production design in this i think is just so accurate in terms of like meg ryan's apartment is just so satisfying though of like actually feeling like you are seeing parts of new york where like yeah a teacher is not going to have a really great place she's like you know like her cabinets are broken like very obviously it's extremely small yeah you know like things are cramped um it, you can feel that things feel hot it's it's i think really evocative of of that time um even if you don't like the movie it's like oh okay <laughs> this can be sometimes miserable sometimes fantastic and it encapsulates both of that like pain and glory so i will definitely say it reminded me all over again why i hate being in new york and why i'm so glad i don't live there hey now hey now um. <laughs> I was just going to say that, so you, I, you said the words pain and glory, which uh, bring me to Pedro Almodovar, of course. And I, the movie that I thought of while watching this, because, of course, it feels like everything has to be in conversation with our first season where we covered Almodovar, uh, was like the this is almost like the exact opposite of Law of Desire, where it's like that movie is a like deep romanticization of the serial killer. Whereas this is so much more the opposite, where it's like that one is this like gay, steamy romance of like, oh, this guy loves me enough to kill for me. Whereas here it's like, oh, fuck, this guy loves me enough to kill me. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, that brings us to like the topic that I wanted to talk about, which is I think this is such a really interesting like take on the erotic thriller, because I I feel like if I think about sort of like the like big run of erotic thrillers of like the eighties and the nineties, so much of it is like. This, like, titillation combined with, like, sexual puritanism. Um, and how so much of it is, like, ooh, like, look at this, like, cool sex. Like, look at all of your favorite movie stars and, like, how, like, their bodies are on screen. But also sex is bad and it will destroy your life, especially if it's, like, extramarital sex. Especially if there's, like, anything, like, remotely kinky going on. It just means that, like, the people who want to have uh, erotic like non-vanilla sex are like bad people Mm -hmm. i feel like that was like so much like the uh hypocrisy basically of like the erotic thriller like of that time and this feels so much like a commentary and sort of like a subversion of like the genre in that like first of all when we're talking about the piano we we're talking about like all of these like different like sexual nuances like of like the different types of sex and i feel like this really like continues in that pattern where i feel like the very first thing that you see mark ruffalo do is like i think like basically eat out like meg ryan's ass and i remember thinking oh like before kissing even like you're just gonna go like straight into ass play no judgment obviously uh but it was like i think what we would call in 2021 a choice Mm -hmm. and i think so much of this movie also is about like mark ruffalo being like i am here to do like whatever it is that you want and uh except to hit you yeah and like i can be whoever you want to be and you can and you can sort you sort of get the sense that like he's like both like a really generous lover and at the same time this guy who like completely keeps his like true self hidden from franny and how she is like really attracted to that like i really loved all of that and i really love that she like both like basically like distrusted this guy but then also was like attracted to a guy that she couldn't fully trust because i don't know that's how women are like sometimes she likes the danger of it and that's the thing she's always been kind of a tourist or a voyeur and at this point she gets to be the person who's playing yeah that like the voyeur from like the jump where she is in the basement of that uh bar watching the cop get the blowjob and she's like she lingers on that for so long because she is drawn into it she like it this is a very anti-kink shaming movie but also just like i don't know this is such a horny movie but Mm -hmm. so like scary in its horniness in a way i mean like even like if we're talking about that blowjob scene it's filmed so like sensually and i feel like it's I think it's, like, fairly rare for to see, like, a woman on screen being turned on by, like, a blowjob, especially since in a, like, a very traditional sense, like, women are not the people being, like, the most pleasured by a blowjob. And so you get, like, this, like, sense, like, from the start that this movie is, like, going to go play with ideas about sex in, like, a way that, like, you don't uh necessarily expect right well and that like the idea of what women find sexually stimulating is possibly so unexplored on a personal individual level that like maybe you are really turned on by watching a guy get a blowjob but like you don't necessarily know that because like you're not really conditioned to even be as aware of like what you find sexually exciting as to what your partner finds sexually exciting which i think is pointed out like pretty specifically in the text where uh when jennifer jason lee's character says like i don't remember anything Mm -hmm. about like my sex partners except like how they like to have sex like that's how i remember them is not like how i like to have it but how they like to have it and so it's this whole movie is seems to be tied up in like women trying to figure out what they find attractive or what they find sexually stimulating well, it's a, I mean, it's, it's definitely about like these power dynamics, obviously, um, like the whole of it. Um, 
And so it's like not just sex, but there's something about like the power that is sexy. And, you know, who has like the that power final to scene, do what? The final like sex scene where like she's like she's riding Mark Ruffalo. Meg Ryan is like riding her, him and he's like, yeah, just just do it. Like, like, take me kind of thing. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's so it's like it's it's much more about dominance and submission, I would say, than than you know purely even just like sex or sexual pleasure but but those things and the fact that she feels so disempowered in this very big very kind of like loud city that you know where sometimes she can't even sleep because she you know is staying with her sister above a strip club and it's just like won't stop like okay well what if i am the person who like takes all of the power here in this situation um the fact that she ends up wearing the guy's jacket in the end is not just plot contrivance um in terms of like she'll have the gun at least because she's got his jacket but the fact that like she's kind of become her own cop like she's the detective she is this um she's the person with the power now yeah I think, um, sorry, going back to, like, an earlier point, even that scene with, like, her student, and we will definitely talk about, like, the whiteness of her project. <laughs> mm-hmm. Of her, like, Which he points project. out, too. Yeah. he's, like... <laughs> like, she's, like, very clearly attracted to her black student, who is, like, taller and, like, much more muscular. Cornelius and, like, Webb. Yes. Um, interesting name. But, um... Yeah, you can tell that, like, they're attracted to each other, even though, like, he has this, like, weird obsession with, like, trying to clear John Wayne Gacy's name. And just, like, the way that, like, so much of, like, her idea of, like, romance is inextricably tied up in these, like, ideas about, like, the possibility or of the sort of, like, inescapability of, like, the concept of sex um, outside of, like, violence, basically. Mm-hmm. like all of our ideas about like romance are wrapped, wrapped up in violence and all of our ideas about sex are wrapped up in violence and that's just sort of like the reality that she lives in i kept coming back to sex in the city and i will try to make this short because like first of all they were like concurrent like i think sex in the city like ran at the same time that this movie came out mm-hmm but also um so they were just sitting at the like next cafe table over I mean, I think so. <laughs> While Kevin Bacon stared in, actually, it was like Charlotte and Samantha were just chatting to the side. <laughs> I think that they were probably in like a much nicer neighborhood than like a teacher would go to or a teacher would live in. But I think like the thing that I really loved about or the th- thing that I found really instructive about this comparison is that like if I recall correctly in like the six seasons or whatever of the show... They've, like, never once discussed sexual assault. And I found that really interesting because the idea that, like, you can be constantly humiliated by, like, dating. Like, that's, like, a through line for the show. But, like, the fact that, like, they never discuss sexual assault, like, basically feels very, like, untrue to me. And Mm -hmm. that's, like, a candy-coated show. So, like, it doesn't have to get into sexual assault. But, um... There's also a sort of, like, dishonesty to that. And I think that because this movie is, like, so entirely about, like, the possibility of sexual assault or even murder, like, right around the corner, um, it just, like, really emphasized that lack uh, on Sex and the City's part for me. And I'm not saying that this is, like, a particularly realistic thing realistic uh film either obviously like we're not operating in the mode of realism but i think it does sort of like get at something about like dating Mm -hmm. and i think that the other thing that i really like about this uh vision of new york city is that because everyone is sort of like living so in such like tight density with each other Like, the people that you least want to see are just, like, are always going to be in, like, the same neighborhood haunts that you are. And so, if there's this, like, inescapability of, like, your sexual past that just, like, adds to the suffocation of everything else about the city. And I was like, yeah, this is why I don't live in New York. 
<laughs> yeah, because Kevin Bacon might show up on your doorstep and uh, talk about killing his dog. That was like so deeply upsetting. And yet I was like, yeah, that is a person. That is the type of person I recognize. Every every bit of Kevin Bacon's character is just like when he shows up, it's like so real. Like is, you know, when he talks with her, like walking with his dog and and that he's ugly, ugly dog. He's like, can you watch the dog? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and and she's like, no. And like the way that the way that she responds, like I, I love them as scene partners because she's responding in a way that's like both trying to be assertive but like please don't hurt me you know like and she's like in a public place and she's like making sure like people can like see and it's like there's a kind of exasperated sense to her where like she is trying to be as kind as possible despite the fact that he is clearly insane and like poses a, a threat to her in in this sense um and and that to me feels really real of like Especially like while he in the gu- while he is in the guise of like a supposedly like what's the word I'm looking for? He's a like, helper. He's he's yeah. like wearing scrubs. You in the know? in the same way that like you assume a cop to be a helper, but it turns out he's not. Like it's that same mold of like a guy who is like given a societal like a gloss by society over like these assumptions of decency and kindness Mm -hmm. and like all of that is just fake yeah and like a gloss that's like oh if i if we just saw those two having a conversation we wouldn't have the thought of how creepy he was like if we saw it from afar but like as soon as you have one word out of his mouth you automatically know like oh this is not this is not the guy that we want to like he's not good also jane campion makes it like she basically just puts like this is the killer like on the screen whenever he appears <laughs> even though he's not because like at every turn it's like oh well obviously he's stalking her he even says when he's talking about killing his dog like i could decapitate it um and like how easy it would be like there are so many just that's why i said like this is like the red herring movie because like there are so many things that she's doing to get us to think it could be anybody which like adds to the terror of it could be anybody and so like it just there is always, even though this movie does maybe languish a little too much, there's still always that like fear in it, even if like it feels like it's lasting too long because you really don't know who the killer is at the, the first time through. Like watching it, I had no idea where it was going. And I like, because I wasn't paying attention to just the dialogue, I was like watching everything as you like said, April, uh, like just looking at all the visual stuff and trying to put it all together. I like, couldn't figure out who was the killer and so was constantly on edge even when i felt a little bored i mean it 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 really kind of mimics what it's like to be a single woman in the city though i'm just like (laughs) really really feeling like it's 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 that that idea that like when you walk down the street like any of them could kill me (laughs) like so just assuming assuming that someone might and just like accepting that danger because you have to accept that danger to kind of walk throughout the world you know i have to accept that danger every time i get on the train and you know like that's that's just part of it and i i like i like the way that meg ryan plays this character in that she also accepts it that she has to accept a certain amount of fear and danger because otherwise you are going to be like stuck in your house you're not going to leave but like you have to overlook some of these these things and to be kind of deluded in a sense to think that you are safe enough to go out so even after she gets mugged and and you know the guy has her id knows where she lives she's just like yeah well you know this is what happens i guess i'm gonna stay with my sister and it's like you know you have to keep living you can't just be afraid all the time yeah i think that's like for me like the strongest part of the movie just like the paranoia of like dwelling on that state of existence and yet at the same time like having to like put that paranoia like off to the back of your mind you mentioned top of the lake and like i think like this movie felt very much to me like a kind of like prelude or maybe like a first draft or something of top of the lake yeah Uh, where so much about it is just sort of like this idea that like you have no idea like which of the 
many, many, many terrorizing men like in your vicinity is the person who is like doing god awful things. And I, I guess like that has like a much more like conventional structure with like the female detective, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But like on the other hand, it like really channels that same feeling of just like, ooh, like what the yeah. fuck is this world and like why am I putting myself through this and yet at the same time like you just have to and was... because you're like trapped in heterosexuality Yikes. yeah did you see the did, there was a like a viral tiktok that going around of like a woman who was talking about like her horrible internet date and how she like went to the guy's house there's just like red flags throughout the entire thing where she's like she went to the guy's house because the guy was just like oh we can go together instead of meeting there she was like sure fine and then eventually like it just happens that like they go through a taco bell drive through and he orders 100 tacos that she then has to pay for and then they go back to like his house and start eating the tacos and then his dad is there and <laughs> And says, like, do you want to go and see my studio? And the TikTok, you know, in her story, she was like, I got my tacos and left. But in my head, like, I I was just like, I assumed that she would say, yeah, of course. And that was the, the thing where, like, I, I'm a person who accepts a certain amount of danger and, like, keeps saying yes, despite the fact that um, – there are all these warning signs that someone might want to kill you. But I was like, oh, yeah, I would absolutely do that. Because I've definitely done that in my own life where I'm just like some stranger says, you know, uh, do you want to come and see these photographs that I have in this studio? And you're like, sure. And that's how you end up becoming an Indiana mole woman. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, you know, that's that's something that is represented in this film is just like, yeah, like people are dying. They found like the remains in her garden, and she's just like, "Well, that's I'm New York. Go on a date. <laughs> that's New York. <laughs> it really oh is God. New York, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um, I want to talk about like one scene that really made an impression on me, and I feel like probably made an impression on you guys. It's when um. Franny discovers her dead sister in her dead sister's bathroom. And then she finds that, like, her sister ha has been beheaded. And the head is in a plastic bag. And she just, like, cradles the head, like, in the plastic bag, like, in her lap, like, against her chest. And cries and just, like, it's such a... Is the right word beautiful? Like, it's so, like, tender and, like disgusting at the same time and that What's was like... in the bag <laughs> it's like it's see-through we know <laughs> and so like that scene just like leapt out at me and i thought like i love jane campion and also this scene is so fucking disgusting it was a weirdly intimate and beautiful scene though in yeah. its own way like yeah it was creepy but who knows like if you found your sibling's disembodied head in a bag, would you have to hug it as you realized they were dead? Great question. Um, I don't know if I love my sibling enough to do that. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. But I, I love the, I love the, I mean, that's what Campion does so well is she makes really kind of horrific things pretty beautiful in her work. Um, and, and I, I just really like Genevieve kind of appreciate Lemon. that. <laughs> there's just there's so much about her work that where you expect a character a character to do one thing, and instead she does like the exact surprising thing that you would not expect, and that that's just kind of so rare when it comes to anyone who's worked in or around Hollywood, and and so that scene I think is is really gorgeous. It's really beautiful, and it's also again like the production design is just like it's so tactile in that moment there's just so there's so much like kind of lushness to it starting from like that fog of steam coming from out of the bathroom and you can tell that she's about to like enter this otherworldly place mm -hmm. of like discovering like obviously her dead sister's body but yeah yeah I, I just I just really appreciate the the willingness and desire to want to do the thing that you shouldn't do. <laughs> I mean, 
like, I think, like, another really good example of that is, like, right after she is mugged, Mark Ruffalo's character comes to Franny's house. And the way that, like, they initiate sex is by, like, Malloy going behind her and basically, like, recreating the mugging. Mm -hmm. And, like, by this point, you get the sense that, like, he also might be, like, a vicious killer. Um, And he, like, really, like, clings to this, like, unknowability when it comes to her. Because we really never know, like, if anything that he says about his own life is true or not. Mm-hmm. Because at every turn he's lying to her, and he she he's like, well, my my ex wife, well, I mean my wife, we're separated, but <laughs> and everything is just like actually just a little bit of a lie enough to like is anything true? You're right. Yeah, but then there's this like weird like tenderness and like sensuality that comes with like him recreating her mugging, and yeah. Like I, that was like another. That was like another scene where like you have this like, ugh, I don't know, like this like combination of like tenderness and like creepiness, and it just like worked really beautifully. Yeah, I I I already mentioned Verhoeven earlier, but I absolutely feel like if I asked Verhoeven about this movie, he'd be like, "Great film, no, no," <laughs> 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 you know, like talking about like like sex violence power these things and sometimes almost like in a caricatured way for him but like like this is you know these are the few directors who are willing to go into those places because they are so thorny like these these issues um i also think the i mentioned this earlier but um the choice to do the color palette so pink is I think such a great thing going against the grain of all of these psychological thrillers um, uh, or any detective story. The, like the entirety is like a pink palette. Um, Yeah. Where are all the blues? Where are the cool, like creepy colors? It's yeah, it's wild. And, and that's just, that's just not something that you see in that genre. And I think visually, like a lot of people were were not prepared for the fact that like there was going to be so much fucking pink. Like it's all over the place. Um, and it's like, you know, like, I think the easiest thing is just to go like full on red and to like get into that kind of like monochromatic, like really kind of bold color choice because it's like, okay, red, sure. That's murder, all these things, but it's pink like throughout there's some, there's some times where there's like a modulation, you know, but it's wildly and that's my favorite color. So I'm, I'm reminded of, I think my favorite outfit of the film, which is when, uh, Franny wears her sit borrows her sister's dress and it's like this like short white and pink like floral dress that's like very it's like, like white with like a style. cherry pattern or something mm-hmm. yeah and it's got like stripes on the shoulders yeah mm-hmm. and it doesn't fit her at all in like style but it also like does I don't know I loved it I, I yeah. just am that dress will stick with me for a while there's a lot of choices that were made in this movie that's the thing that you can never fault campion for is just like you know because so much of being a director is you're just making choices one choice after another after another and like she's making choices here and they are bold and you can't say that she was like asleep at the wheel you know this is what she wanted to do speaking of choices do you guys think that we were supposed to find um Franny's project of documenting black slang, like, embarrassing? Or do you think that's just, like, 2003? I think it's just 2003 because this is before, like, even Freedom Writers came out. (laughs) Shut up. I think it's mostly 2003, even though I think Campion was a little bit aware of it. Because, like we mentioned earlier, um, Cornelius is allowed to have a voice of, of, like, this seems weird. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> like, like you're being a tourist into like the way that I speak and you're like studying me like I'm like a zoo animal or something like w- what is your deal um, and how he's like I should get paid for this yeah and he's right <laughs> it's like yeah you really should the guy who worships John Wayne Gacy is correct yes I also think it's interesting like I, I think that comes up again when like it's not as explicit, but when Meg Ryan, as Ingu laughed at yesterday while we were watching, says the word poppy, a word that she's probably never said before. Um, <laughs> and so, like, yeah, just putting those types of things in her mouth as well is just kind of, like, very jarring, but in a way that doesn't seem unaware. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think that, like, a part of it is just her and this, like, role of, like, the observer and the absorber. Like, the way that she is constantly taking in things from around her. Um, especially with, like, the stupid poetry and motion stuff. Just as, like, someone, just this person who is, like, really trying to, like, be open to the city, right? Like, that's why she's constantly writing things down in her notebook. That's why she's observing the slang around her that she doesn't understand. And part of, like, being that open is, like, as we come back to, like, our main theme, like, part of accepting all like a possibility of danger but she is going to be someone who is going to she she is just like a person who like is by nature receptive because that is the way that she lives her life for better or worse yeah but for all that she's like an observer taking in everything around her she's still not able to solve the crime that we've been that she's been given all the clues to I didn't say she was a good observer (laughs) Right, but I I don't mean that as a critical thing either. I just mean that like that is part of like yeah, even even if you are are able to see everything, you're not able to figure it out until after the fact. Most, She's a most good of the observer. Time. She's not the best processor maybe. Right. I I did have one thought while watching this, which is that if this if this movie came out in 2017, then instead of seeing subway poetry, she would have seen um, one of those subway ads for uh, the snowman where it said, Mr. Police, you could have saved her. I gave you all the clues. I gave you all the clues. Yeah, yeah. that that would have been a thing she saw. Yeah, I'm like, glad you yeah. mentioned that because this doesn't have to go in the pod, but like. I feel like April and I literally sent each other like two years worth of Mr. Snowman memes. <laughs> <laughs> I still think about them. I still think about the, the snowman shit. Like it's too good. Um, I mean, imagine Jane Campion doing the snowman. She gave us all the clues. Yeah. Um, I love it. I would love yeah. it. Give her a hairy hole, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like I mean, she did. <laughs> She's had a few of those in her movies already, yeah. (laughs) Um, I do think that, like, all of the clues that she gives us, though, is, like, they all seem so well thought out from a, like, written perspective of, like, I'm going to put all of these different, like, clues and, as I've said over and over again, like, red herrings just woven into this thing. And, like, watching it a second time, it was really cool to see that framework in a way like to see the pieces as you go like when you hear her hear early in the film like oh it takes at least three women to die for it to be an interesting story and then like you realize afterward like oh three women died in this movie and like those types of things that uh are just like small little throwaways but actually when you go back and watch it again you're like oh okay i think it was very well constructed well that's i mean there's a certain meta-ness to this and a knowingness but you know to your point earlier daniel you were talking about sometimes it feels like jane campion doing a lifetime movie and i'm not going to disagree with that uh because but the thing is that it's like what if a lifetime movie were artistically done and like i actually enjoy those stories and i think they're great but like i've worked on the set of a lifetime movie and you know they're moving very quickly they don't have a lot of time for art or for like performance or any of these things if you get any of that out of those movies then like good you know good job because they're not going to give you those tools but then campion you know makes a more complex version of this and it's like it to me it still feels satisfying in that way because you still get that ending that i want i still get the 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 things that i like and um you know almost and of course like let's try to define it a camp if you will uh, in a sense um or just you know a knowingness or a kind of um sleight of hand cheesiness that like in Campion's hands for me feels you know really really intellectual and artistic <laughs> I mean I want to sort of like push back against like a lifetiminess a little bit uh because I feel like when people refer to lifetime movies they're basically talking about movies about women in danger mm-hmm. and that is sort of like a way of basically dismissing what is often like a story written and directed by women about like the perils that women face. And I feel like a lot of that uh, dismissal has to do with the fact that like 
men who are like by and large the tastemakers in our society do not want to take those concerns seriously and so it gets relegated to like oh that's like lifetime material and i do feel like in the last like 10 or so years we have been getting this uh revision and like what counts as prestige and i think that I don't know, if you're looking at something like, for example, the first season of Big Little Lies, or if you're looking at something like, I don't know, Jane Campion's entire oeuvre, I think like we are in a period now where we are able to take the concept of like women constantly being in danger as like a serious concept and as a subject for serious art much more than we used to be. Right, like... If it had come out 20 years ago, A Simple Favor would have been a Lifetime movie. Well, I mean, that would be true because it's directed by a man, and most Lifetime movies are written and directed by men. I thought they were changing that. They are now, but historically, I mean, since that network has been around, women weren't writing and directing any of that stuff for, hmm. um, uh, until the past 10 years. Okay. So the past decade is when they were like, oh, I guess we should give women more of a shot. But uh, men predominantly wrote and directed all of those films. Okay. Um, Burning Bed, all the way back to Burning Bed, all of those movies. It's, mm. it's, it's, um, we, we don't, I think that the problem is we don't know what that story is or what a Lifetime movie is because, or how Lifetime changed the way that we see women's stories because women were never telling them from the beginning so I, it's hard to classify like they might have is... been more jane campion style like they might have been a number of in the cut style films if it were women's telling these stories yeah we but the thing is we don't really i don't really know i mean and we also i mean there was a knowingness of what Lifetime was doing when they were buying these scripts. There was a kind of nihilism to them. Like when you when you look back at like who was buying and, and uh, making uh, movies back then, there was a nihilism of um, just thinking that women would like anything that had this stuff. And, and so they just they would hire a bunch of like the same guys over and over to do this and like just kind of cranking them out. So there was no thought to them. There's, you know, like the few that stand out are the ones that, you know, obviously like the burning bread, the burning bed, like I mentioned, but um, you know, it, there was, there was already an infusion of camp and there was an unseriousness about violence um, and danger for women, except for, and again, this is the reason why the movie was so big burning bed was like huge and even then there's like a, a certain kind of like not understanding exactly how to get the tone right uh the whole time but it takes that violence seriously in in a way that um really kind of transformed a lot of stuff but then they dropped it and then it was just camp 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 which i love but um it just it really shaped what we thought women's entertainment was for so long that i don't know if we know what it is well and it makes me wonder also then since things have shifted in the last 10 years or so like if in the cut came out now would people like it more i think people like it now more than they did before because i've definitely ever since i wrote that defense of it in the ron tomatoes book i've seen a lot of people who are finding it uh now on criterion because it's on the criterion channel um, for the neo-noirs and they're starting to see it as more of a neo-noir than a psychological or erotic thriller so they're huh. it's it's changing genre in a sense because you know genres go in and out of fashion and i feel like in in this way if you're looking at it um, of a tradition of neo-noirs it, it actually kind of fits um, it makes a lot actually like putting it in the neo-noir part of my head makes it like feel better for me like in terms of like liking it as a movie uh when i'm thinking of it as this psychosexual thriller it kind of it doesn't do it for me but thinking about it in that neo-noir category i'm definitely much more interested in considering it in that vein but isn't it also just like a function of certain genres being endowed with like more prestige than yep. others and therefore like and also more different expectations sure I think it's fun as an erotic thriller because I feel like it has so much uh, going for it in terms of like commenting on the erotic thrillers like 
of the past and just like how I, I, I think of like if erotic thrillers as I previously discussed was sort of predicated on a kind of like hypocrisy mm-hmm. this is sort of talking about like the contradiction of like female heterosexual desire where you want sex and you want love and yet at the same time you have to constantly contend with like danger from men right and so like it spins like the contradictions built into the erotic thriller like into a more feminist critique and so i think it does like really interesting stuff with the erotic thriller and so i think it's fine to like it as an erotic thriller um and i'm probably saying that because i like it as an erotic thriller but that's my story I gotta say, this discussion has made me like the movie more than I did having just watched it on my own. I think that y'all really helped me understand why it's better than I thought it was. Oh, that was my only goal today, was just to convince (laughs) you. Thank you. I I, I always wanted to be a lawyer, and (laughs) now I'm arguing on behalf of In the Cut. (laughs) Well, I appreciate that you have convinced me, a man, that a work by a woman is good. (laughs) Is that what we're here for? (laughs) always all right well that's the end of our discussion of in the cut but now it's time for some rankings i mean i don't i don't like ranking if you don't want to participate that's totally fine okay i don't i (laughs) i'm like it's always my least favorite part of film criticism was having to rank things because like i'm looking at this and i'm like how do i rank angel at my table and sweetie like well those (laughs) go at the bottom of course like (laughs) what (laughs) (laughs) dang i really didn't like sweetie or angel at my table oh my god sweetie was like pulling teeth i like I said, and the they shoot horses, don't they, of of film lovers. Of like I, you know, I, I thought it was hilarious. I was like, I can't wait. And then like when she does die, I'm just like, oh my god, I feel awful now. And the whole time I was cheering for it, and I felt bad. And it's just like it's just such a she got you. It's a beautiful film. I think that rankings are the worst, worst type of film criticism out there and yet we do it on our show apparently and yet we do it because i think it it injects like a nice bit of acidity and just like judgment i will go first i think i'm gonna do the piano first holy smoke bright star in the cut an angel at my table and sweetie i feel like that's like very justifiable yeah, but the correct answer is Holy Smoke first, <laughs> followed by the piano, and then Bright Star, and then, um, you know, I think I liked Angel at My t- Table better than The Cut, so Angel at My Table, In the Cut, and then Sweetie. You're both wrong. <laughs> What's the correct ranking? There is none. They're all perfect. <laughs> well, then we're not wrong. We're both right. <laughs> Hilarious to call Sweetie and an angel at my table perfect, but... Are you fucking serious? Janet Frame? A biopic of Janet Frame that is, like, gorgeous and impressionistic Who? and... <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I know we just met, but I hate you. <laughs> That's my role on this podcast. That's the energy we're going for every episode. So I've succeeded today. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and hating Daniel April. Oh, thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. (laughs) I got I got Daniel to like in the cut a little bit more than Sweetie, so I guess that's (laughs) something. Uh (laughs) (laughs) For sure. And that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening. We're always happy to have you with us. If you'd like to contact us, we are at allaboutfilmpod at gmail.com and we'll be back with you next week talking about the first season of Top of the Lake. I think we should wrap up my stomach ache that I have 
been having on and off for like 20 hours is threatening to return. Um, April, how much of Jane... That's a great transition for the pod. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> 